Good afternoon. I'm Don Martin, your MC for the closing session of Series 2020. The time is now. I'm also the Executive Vice President of Series, a nonprofit organization working with the world's most influential investors and companies to transform the economy, to build a sustainable future for people and the planet. Before I start, however, I'd like to express our heartfelt sympathy for the family and friends of George Floyd and the countless other victims of racial violence. Series stands in strong solidarity with black, brown, indigenous, and other people of color who have been denied the very basics of humanity since the founding of our country. As an organization dedicated to building a just and sustainable future, we at Series realize that eliminating systemic racism is necessary to creating the kind of future we seek. The impacts of the climate crisis, water pollution and scarcity, deforestation, and other environmental harms fall disproportionately on communities of color, as well as the poor and marginalized. So too is the case with the compounding COVID-19 pandemic that has shined a similar light on the deep and longstanding fissures of racial inequality that are so searingly evident today and must be urgently addressed. At Ceres, we know that systemic challenges like the climate crisis and COVID-19 require systemic solutions. So today's closing session will be both reflective and forward-looking as we discuss how the turmoil of the last few months can help us build back better to create a more just and sustainable future for generations to come. We must work together harder and faster to drive solutions that will address the economic stress and environmental and social inequities we face. Worldwide, more than $10 million has been allocated to kickstart economies in the face of the pandemic, including more than $2.3 trillion in the United States. And that figure most certainly will continue to grow. To put, in, to put this into context, the $2.3 trillion in the US that has already been set aside is easily double what was spent in response to the 2009 financial crisis. This staggering amount of money can bring about extensive long-lasting changes in the structure of our, of our economies. If we opt, however, for the status quo, the emissions that have been declining in recent months will certainly resume their upward and potentially catastrophic trajectory. A far better path is to build back better with climate smart recovery that supports targeted environmental and social incomes while producing strong economic growth and job creation. One way to ensure we do this is to prioritize business strategies and policies that align with the Paris Agreement goal to limit global temperature rise to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. From offshore wind development and clean transportation to sustainable infrastructure and energy efficient buildings. We have an opportunity to leverage federal funds and redirect resources to more meaningful and efficient investments. Sustainable investments that will produce real change across every sector and in underserved communities to put people back to work. So before we dig into these issues today with our esteemed panelists, I have a few housekeeping notes that I just wanna make. So please note that this session is being recorded and we'll provide all participants with a link to the recording shortly after its completion. And if any of you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box that's on the bottom of your control panel. And we'll do our best to get to as many of those questions as possible before the end of the session. I also wanna flag that there's the potential that, that some of us may experience some global bandwidth issues that are really beyond our control. If this does happen, the discussion will simply pause for about 30 seconds to allow the bandwidth to readjust. And so I want to thank you ahead of time for your patience in the event such an issue arises, and thanks for your patience as we move through it. Finally, I wish to highlight and say how much we appreciate the generous commitment and support of our sponsors, without whom Series 2020 would not be possible. And so now it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, series CEO and president, Mindy Luber. Over to you, Mindy. Great, thanks. Um, and we will quickly jump in. We've got with us today three extraordinary people, people who are change makers, who can move mountains and money, or maybe money and mountains, um, 
but who are change makers and with us on this journey of how to build back better. Um, the first person is Michael Frerichs. He is the treasurer of the state of Illinois, uh, elected first in 2014 and then again in 2018. He's the state's chief investment and banking officer. The office invests money on behalf of the state and many local units of government and actively manages $31 billion. And Alex Lifman, Global Environmental Executive of Bank of America, she too can move mountains and move money, is Global Environmental Executive at B of A. Alex is responsible for the company's environmental sustainability strategy, oversees operational goals, environmental business initiatives, and policy positions. And finally, Kenny Thompson, Jr., Head of External Affairs at North America PepsiCo. We know the size of PepsiCo. Again, the people on this call are people who can move mountains and money. Uh, Kenny, given the size of his company, leads PepsiCo's company-wide strategy for investing, building, and maintaining signature partnerships with external stakeholders to drive business growth and community impact. And again, these people were chosen because they are the leaders who are going to help us move forward in a way that's positive, that's constructive. We are going through a moment of difficulty, certainly in the United States, uh, but there is lots of room for optimism if we do it right and not so much if we do it wrong. And what I'm talking about in doing it right or doing it wrong, as Dawn said, there'll be 12 or $13 trillion globally spent to build out of the COVID crisis. We could look backwards and build a fossil fuel economy, uh, or we could look forward and build a new economy that creates the same jobs, the same economic stimulus, uh, but thinks about infrastructure and design and types of energy and transportation systems wildly differently. Uh, and those are two very different options. I think with people who I'm gonna start with, like Treasurer Frerichs, we have a shot at doing it right. So Michael, Federal state governments will invest trillions of dollars to help the US economy recover from the crisis. We're seeing stimulus packages. We suspect there will be an infrastructure package after the election, all about building back better, getting out of the financial crisis that COVID put us in. Uh, but we could do it, as I said, in multiple ways. You are beautifully positioned in the state of Illinois, a leadership state with a leadership position that you sit in, how do we help ensure that we rebuild the economy of the future that's climate resilient, that's inclusive, that's equitable, rather than create or recreate the status quo? Uh, well, thank you, Mindy. Uh, it has become very clear that recreating the status quo is unacceptable. Companies need robust risk management plans in place to ensure business continuity and resiliency through systemic threats like climate change. We also see other threats out there, uh, whether they be viruses that the administration, I think, has just sort of put their heads in the sand and hope they would go away. COVID's not going away. Climate change is not going away. This threat is closely entwined with acute shocks like health pandemics. Environmental stewardship does not exist in a vacuum. So as noted in an earlier session, building back better, Environmental issues like other material issues do not have to take a backseat as we rebuild our economy from the COVID crisis. I think some people have thought, well, we'll have to deal with that later because we just have bigger issues right now. We need to ensure that achieving climate strategies helps preserve jobs or creates them if preservation is not possible. As we move forward, we need to ensure that job quality and benefits will not decline for working families currently in the carbon sector as part of a just transition to a low carbon economy. Institutional investors like ourselves and others we work with own about 80% of the US equity markets, 80%. Uh, among that universe, pension funds are the largest asset owners. And we often find ourselves among this cohort, particularly among the public pensions and treasury agencies. So as sizable owners of publicly traded companies and major clients of the biggest fund managers, we have a significant role to play. We seek to take governmental investment standards to a new level, one that recognizes the sustainable environmental, social, human capital, business model, 
and governance practices are strongly related to safer, more innovative, better performing companies. So we're going to ask when we're building back better, ask corporations to enhance the disclosure of sustainability risks and opportunities, highlighting key issues and ESG matters of importance to company performance and strategy, and base that on material considerations. We want to address the task force on climate related financial disclosures, TCFD recommendations for disclosing comparable and consistent information about climate change risks and opportunities. We think that when we have more information that's out there in public, these corporations will make better decisions and we as investors will make better decisions. So we hope that they adopt a reporting framework. There are many reporting frameworks that can help companies. We believe SASB offers a valuable model for companies to consider. This identifies material and relevant issues and encourages development and disclosure of metrics that demonstrate the company's progress managing sustainability issues. Um, a few things we need to do better, further refine our evaluation engagement on asset managers on sustainability topics. And we conduct due diligence to evaluate the scope and quality of each manager's approach to sustainability. This includes an evaluation of ESG integration, their company analysis, their engagement and proxy voting activities. Uh, but I believe more can be done to enhance the way in which we evaluate and engage our asset managers on ESG topics. Great. Um, a note of optimism is great. And I think with those kinds of changes, we can build back better. Uh, I'm gonna turn to Alex. Alex, obviously, um, or I shouldn't say obviously, but similarly, the banks have a critical role to play in deploying billions of dollars. Uh, and it should be noted that you all have committed to, to deploying hundreds of billions of dollars with a B, not an M. Uh, and you've done that to some extent already, and you've, and you've got commitments to continue doing that. Um, as we move from the immediate crisis to the longer term recovery, how do you frame, how does Bank of America think about ensuring climate resilience and social inclusion being fully considered. And, and let me add one note as well. Um, in addition to those hundreds of billions of dollars, B of A has made um, huge philanthropic commitments and has a National Consumer Advisory Committee that, that has been addressing civil rights and issues of racism for 20 years, not 20 days. Um, so you've got a good start in those, maybe it's 18 years, um, but a good long start with the leadership um, of a very diverse community. How do you build on that? How do you build on your commitment to hundreds of billions of dollars uh, and to addressing some of the ills of racism and equity as we build back better? Yeah, no, thank you, Mindy. And first of all, thank you to the team for an amazing series over the last couple of months. It's been um, incredibly engaging and informative and uh, I really applaud your leadership and series leadership in trying to bring together the nexus of environmental issues and social issues and health issues as we've seen lately and really think about them in an, in an integrated way in this discussion. Um, because I think it's a, it's a tremendously important idea as we deploy resources. Michael talked about public resources as we deploy private resources, whether that be capital or people or leadership capacity, um, we have to ensure that they are focused on building back in a more sustainably way, a socially, environmentally, economically sustainable way. And I think, you know, too often we look at investments as a zero sum game. I don't know, maybe this comes from when we were children and we were all competing with our siblings for our parents' attention. There's this idea that we have to lose in one area to really gain in another. Um, and that's just simply not true. We have enough resources to address all of these issues simultaneously. We have capacity as a society to do that. And to your point and to Don's point in the opening, I think there's really a danger that we focus resources in rebuilding our economy without necessarily focusing resources to build, rebuild sustainably. And then even if we do incorporate environmental sustainability, there's a real danger that we leave off that really important element of social sustainability. Um, you know, last year, Brookings put out a study. I give a lot of credit to Adi Tomer and Mark Muro and others at Brookings. And it was about 
uh, clean energy jobs and the dynamics of who those are going to. And clean energy jobs pay better than your average wage. There are lower barriers, barriers to entry oftentimes in those jobs in terms of educational or experience barriers. But that study found what most of us know to be true, that that is a white man's game right now. I mean, that is that industry is dominated right now by white males. So I think it's an important, it was a really important study. I think it's really important for us to be very intentional as we're thinking about building back to bring these, um, these issues of sustainability together. Um, and we certainly don't have the secret sauce at Bank of America. I think we're all struggling on how, with how we integrate these issues and really think of them, about them comprehensively. But I'll just I'll point to a couple of things that we've been thinking a lot about. Obviously, on the capital side of the equation, Mindy, you hearken to this. We have big capital commitments uh, to address climate change, to address outsized demand on natural resources. We also have big capital commitments that we're putting to work to address racial inequality. We've been doing that for many, many years. We'll continue to do that. Um, you know, burgeoning health issues like COVID. But how do we bring that all together? And you had on a session earlier in the series, uh, Karen Fang, who's our head of sustainable finance, and she supports our sustainable markets committee um, that are, it includes, you know, the senior most leaders of the bank. And she has a sustainable working group that she runs. And we're bringing together, you know, we have energy bankers sitting alongside community development bankers, sitting alongside the business leaders that are providing uh, in, you know, investments and lending to uh, minority businesses, all sitting together to think about how do we ensure when we're deploying this capital, this sort of this comprehensive capital, that we're bringing all of these issues together um, in a really, really intentional way. We're doing that within our business groups. We're doing that within our supply chain. Um, last year, we went carbon neutral as an institution. We went 100% renewable. And as we were doing the RFP for who was going to put solar panels on the roofs of our facilities, we very intentionally incorporated diversity standards into those contracts. We want to ensure if people are on the roof of our building putting solar and if we're uh, you know, putting out big contracts, that those are representative of the communities in which we operate. And we're weaving that through a whole host of areas in our supply chain as well. But I think that just speaks to kind of the integration that we really need to think about. Um, if we want to make huge strides as we start to deploy capital to get to you know, economic, bring back the economy, economic sustainability, we really have to think about not just environmental sustainability, but also social sustainability and how that all comes together. Right. And one of your points just now is a perfect microcosm. We're going to be spending not what you're spending and we being the global community uh, on solar panels. And believe me, for all of B of A, I assume that alone is a substantial amount. But as we spend money, as we spend public dollars, how do we make sure we're doing things like making sure the jobs are equitable, they're fair, they're paid well, they're in the right communities? Um, so some good examples there and great background. I'm going to jump to you, Kenny, because we've had asset owners, banks, uh, but who are the other major power players who I think move markets? And that's certainly Fortune 100 companies. Um, you're a key leader uh, at PepsiCo who has done a lot on what I consider an ESG integrated platform from your um, six or eight years on performance with purpose, where the company had goals for water and climate and diversity, human rights, I mean, across the, across the supply chain, um, and met those goals. You have figured out um, and shown that you could integrate sustainability into your core business and not only into special initiatives. Um, but when we think about leaders on building back better, and I know Pepsi has thought about that a lot, how do you see your role in the broader role of corporations in doing exactly that, in building back better, in integrating your position into the policy discussion out there and what um, you're doing at the company and what you see are key priorities for your partnerships? Sure. Uh, first off, thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. What a great group. Um, you know, this year is 
so much different. You know, January is so much different than, than June. And I think we've seen so much change over the course of the past six months. We just didn't expect it. And um, I think our company, is, as well as many others, are in a different place than they were just six months ago. Um, you know, as you mentioned, PepsiCo has always been engaged um, on several different policy issues. We've always worked uh, with external stakeholders to make sure that we were doing uh, what was necessarily needed in the community. And when we saw what was happening with COVID specifically, uh, the 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 effects of on the African American and Latino and minority communities, the disparate uh, impacts. Um, our leadership said, "What can we do?" And I think that's where it starts for all of us. Like our leadership said, "What can we do about this?" And you know, I think over the course of the past three or four months, that we've seen things from Pe PepsiCo that we haven't done before. And and I think that's what we're learning is is the ability to stretch, the ability to do things that we haven't necessarily been asked to do, but people saying, yes, let's figure out how to do that. Whether or not it's providing testing kits or providing school meals or transportation or laptops. Um, as I've we said before, these are about local and giving and delivering what community needs, not necessarily a top-down approach. I think that is one of the things that our leadership has stressed to us is, you know, we want to do what is necessary locally, and we want to provide what is necessary and the needs that they need uh, specifically to those localities. Um, I think that is what we've we figured out how to do very well, um, not only on on COVID response, but we just launched a $400 million uh, initiative on racial justice, and that is something that came from our leadership and figuring out what we can do internally as pepsico what are our hiring practices are we partnering with the right community colleges and externally how can we partner with organizations that are working on social justice issues ranging from policing to health and wellness to education and making sure that pepsico is a part of all of these discussions and all of these different communities um, i think that is really what i've been impressed by this company the past two or three months is the ability to do things quickly and effectively. And I think we've learned so much over the course of the past year of what we can do as a company. And I think that this is a great foundation for us. Great, great. So Alex, let's go back to you. I mean, we know what we need to do. We really do. We need to make sure the $12 trillion as a start um, is allocated in a way that's just, that's equitable, and that gets us a future that's climate aligned and not a future that we can't deliver uh, with any integrity for our kids to have a life. Um, and it is that simple. Uh, it's been, you know, these issues are politicized, they're difficult, they're tough, they're moving quickly, more quickly than we could imagine. What are some of the things, I mean, I, as a bank, you could reach out to other banks, you could weigh into policy, you could bring other people together. Let's dig into some of the ways to do exactly what we're talking about. So it's not be a very worrying about the panels and who's installing them, which is great, but it's the law of the land or every bank or every large institution. So uh, let me, yeah, how do we get this out of the political world of ours versus these as an example, uh, but go ahead. Well, I will say, I actually think we really need to start by engaging a broader sphere of people in the discussion. Um, you know, this has been talked about a lot, right? We surround ourselves with people who look like ourselves. We um, get news from news outlets that are catering to our perspectives. Um, and, you know, so often now we're talking at each other or, or shouting at each other um, and we're not really listening and engaging with each other to address these really big issues and if you look you know i'm sure kenny has a flavor of this as well at pepsico if you look at bank of america we operate in 35 countries around the globe um, we operate in uh, states we have you know on the ground operations in states across the country um, we have a very diverse employee base, a very diverse individual customer base, a very diverse client base and, and community base and so on. Um, and so we've really been working hard to drive a dialogue across these diverse and frankly divergent views um, to 
get to some better common, common understanding because we feel strongly that if we're going to move faster and bigger, um, we, we have to have that common understanding. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing internally, I'll talk a little bit internally and I'll talk a little bit externally. One of the things that we've been doing internally, actually over the past five years, because we like to think of these issues as being new issues, they're not new issues, right? These have been issues that have been around for a while now, right? So we've been doing this for a while. We've been having something that we call courageous conversations internally. Um, and these have been on, you know, a whole range of topics, gender equity, domestic violence, the immigrant experience, um, what, you know, LGBT uh, plus communities experience, and of course, racial uh, inequity as well. And um, just a week or so ago, our CEO, Brian Moynihan, held a global town hall, all 200 plus thousand of our employees participating. And um, he had a, a very real discussion with um, Lonnie Bunch, who is the secretary of the Smithsonian, who we worked with really closely um, on the launch of the um, uh, National Museum of African um, you know, history and uh, culture in uh, DC. And we had Mark Morial, and who you know very well, and, and Janet Marvia from um, the National Urban League and UNIDOS. Um, and it was a real conversation about understanding the experience of people of color in this country um, and how we individually and collectively need to do better, um, and specifically what the bank is doing and what the bank should be doing. Um, and it wasn't an easy conversation. It was, um, it was, as I said, real. It was, it was raw um, at many times, but um, it was incredibly important. And it is the type of conversation that we need to have around a whole range of issues, including climate, where we bring everyone to the table and really listen to each other um, and try to drive um, more common understanding. Um, you talked a little bit about what we're doing externally with NCAC. Um, we have had this longstanding external advisory council in place. It started out a social advisory council. And then as you know, Mindy, we, um, we added environmental leaders um, and I'll be honest, there was some hesitance kind of back to that zero sum game. There was this thought that we would dilute our focus on social issues by doing so. Um, but we haven't, and we've been able to address the issues that Don, you know, really have conversations around the issues that Don talked about at the beginning of this call, how, um, you know, communities of color, low income and uh, other communities are the worst hit by climate and other environmental issues. They're the least able to build back. Um, and also to ensure that we uh, really tap into opportunity um, as we invest in a low carbon economy. We have to rebuild the whole infrastructure and systems of this country and everyone should um, have an opportunity in that. And that's a lot of the dialogue that we have at NCAC. And I think Mindy would tell you those conversations, again, they are honest, um, they are often positive, but they're often critical as well. Um, and we talk about uh, a lot of detail in terms of how we have to, um, what we need to do as a business, um, but they're constructive, they're incredibly valuable. And I think it's what we need across, you know, big organizations that are diverse and across big constituencies that are diverse to really adapt and change and, and grow for what we need to do for the new economy. Right, and I think uh, your tying together social and environmental issues are, are crucial. There is no business, there is no economy without addressing climate, water shortages, resource and equity and racism. Kenny, I wanna to go to a specific area and that's water where we can't survive as an economy and we can't su survive as a humanity um, without addressing water, a subset of climate. And it is very definitely about um, equity, where the water problems are. Um, how is PepsiCo looking at um, clean water and access to water, both nationally and globally? Uh, and what are the levers that you've taken to move that? It's a good example of this is our economy, our life, and our future. Right. I remember um, my first day at PepsiCo seven years ago, um, Indra Nui uh, in her sort of welcome packet uh, going through policy. Uh, indicated that water is a fundamental human right and access to water is a fundamental human right. And so thus far since 2006, we've delivered 44 million uh, safe water to 44 million people. And, you know, we've done that by multiple levers. Um, obviously, advocacy is a, 
uh, key lever working with folks like Michael and other public uh, officials to promote uh, smart public policy and regulation, but also look for focusing on water use internal, our agriculture policy, making sure that we are not uh, using more water than we need, um, working on our operations, you know, our manufacturing plants, our warehouses, making sure that those are uh, running efficiently. Um, and also putting water back, water replenishment. How can we invest in infrastructure projects um, to, to help uh, harness and put back water? And also wetland uh, rest wetland restoration. restoration. Um, how do we take care of um, our environment around us where we have where we have operations? And look, having access to clean water is is fundamental. And as we noted earlier, Alex noted a second ago, a lot of these uh, issues are happening in uh, minor minority uh, communities. And we've seen this all across the country and obviously uh, all across the world. But we feel like uh, with, with partnerships that we've got with the Nature Conservancy and uh, WWF and uh, International Development Bank, um, we are getting to the, to the problem locally and figuring out what folks need in whether it's Detroit or or in India and how do we make sure that PepsiCo is delivering uh, exactly what the community needs. But yes, um, water is um, essential for our business, but it's also essential for humanity. And uh, I think for PepsiCo, we've always put humanity first. So I think that's why we've always had a really forward leaning uh, water policy and that continues but we just released our sustainability report last week with some uh, ambitious goals so you know that's part of that's part of the challenge is continue to push ourselves to do better um, and not settle for the status quo so uh, you know we we feel we feel like we're moving in the right direction but obviously there's a long way to go so I think what you just said is setting goals um, we know where we need to go on climate water is part of it justice is part of it it is about getting to that 1.5 degrees. We don't need to debate it, it's science. We know where we need to get. Um, Michael, the, the world of pension funds uh, and large asset owners is about one of the most powerful worlds that you're part of. Um, and we wanna build out, what does a Paris aligned portfolio look like? So every pension fund like you uh, are thinking about from today on, how do you get to a Paris aligned portfolio? So let me ask you, how do we get there? What do we need to do? How can we be helpful? Uh, well, you know, I, I'll repeat again, climate risks aren't going away just because uh, we've been dealing with a pandemic uh, and people think that we can just wish that away and return to normal. That's not going to happen. So as government agencies and investors pursue efforts to recover from this downturn, uh, they shouldn't lose sight of the climate crisis. Uh, during these sessions, we've heard from a variety of thought leaders on the many different aspects of climate risk that investors need to consider, from energy transition, economic recovery. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. And our work in factoring in climate-related economic and financial risk is continually evolving. You know, we don't, we can't give a, a blueprint out there. We think that we're making uh, we're a much better place today than we were five years ago. We think we'll be in a much better place with better data and information five years from now. So investors are increasingly facing compounding systemic risks that challenge our ability to deliver long-term returns for beneficiaries. We do think that addressing climate risks helps build resiliency, both for business and for investors. Climate transition strategies represent a major economic opportunity for businesses and investors. As businesses recognize that transitioning to a net zero can create significant new employment and economic opportunities. So how are we taking climate risk into account? It's pervasive, it's systemic, and it presents risks for us as investors. So uh, this type of systemic risk can't be diversified away. As a result, uh, we as investors must employ a range of strategies to manage climate risk, such as balancing exposures through sector allocation, focusing exposures on best-in-class securities and actively engaging individual companies on key climate-related factors to encourage enhanced disclosure and performance. And this is a place where we like working with series because we get a lot more done when we work together. So um, we integrate all of these risk consider considerations into three pillars, our internal management of funds, our external managers, 
and exercising active ownership or engagement with corporations. So those are some of the things that we do here in this office. You know, a, a big part of that is our proxy voting. We actively exercise our proxy, proxy voting rights, supporting important proposals on climate issues and voting to hold directors accountable for their actions or non-actions. Uh, advocacy and policy making. We engage lawmakers and government entities to promote and enhance climate disclosure and sustainable investing practice and to make sure that we maintain our rights as investors to be involved this way. And uh, once again, I'll just reiterate uh, the work we get done, we do in coalitions. We participate in coalitions and work collaboratively with many other investors focused on climate related issues through series and other organizations and initiatives. Uh, we very much like series, but we work Climate Action 100 and PRI, the Investor Agenda, uh, Climate Majority Project. So that's the real sort of call. Uh, make sure you are working on ESG internally and you're finding others to align with. Great. And yes, there, um, the power of asset owners is clear in the list of things you just went through. Companies care about their owners and their investors. Policymakers care. Um, and it's an extraordinarily important voice and, and a pleasure and delightful to work with you. So let's think about, we've probably got 10 or 15 minutes more. Um, what are the most important things we need to issue together, a call to action? What are the most important things to build back better tomorrow or next week? And whether it's a bill by um, Nancy Pelosi or anyone else, we are seeing these dollars put out into the marketplace. Um, they are moving so quickly that we're not even impacting them. What are the, and policy is but one way. How do we make sure? that we are doing everything we can to build back better. We are at a pivot point. We can go in one direction or the other. One direction locks us in, in a way our kids have no shot. The other direction moves us in the right direction. What more can we be doing? And let me um, start with Kenny because I want to. And then we'll go to you, <laughs> Alex, and then back to Michael who's already started on this. Fair enough, fair enough. Oh, look, I mean, I think uh, we've got to do a bunch of things at the same time. Um, and I think we're going to figure out real fast um, who and what entities that we can we can lean on to for to, to support these efforts. Um, I'll say a lot of the changes that we've made at PepsiCo have come from internal pressure from young people who are working at our company saying, hey, we need to do something about this. And I think you've seen across the country, young people speaking their minds and pushing public policy in a fashion faster than I think we've maybe seen in a very long time. Um, and I think it's from a, a private sector standpoint, it's really important for us to listen to these folks and understand that they they are the obviously the future, but they've also, uh, they're, they're in it every day. And I think sometimes uh, at corporations, we end up talking to ourselves a lot. And it's really important to make sure that we are actively engaged with organizations and people who are out there every single day and and listening to them and, and telling us what they need and i think it's also time for corporations and, and private sector uh entities to do things they've never done before you know a lot of corporations haven't really spoken out on issues they haven't really um you know gotten out in front on, on certain things but those times are over and i think more and more consumers and customers want to know what our companies are doing in certain specific areas whether it's environmental sustainability or racial justice and people want to know what pepsico and bank of america and you name it are doing about these issues every day and you know i think that's where it starts it starts with listening i've, I've said that for the past month and a half it really starts with listening and having a conversation with people folks uh, to understand and to have a dialogue we always want to be at the table and i think that's where it starts and just to follow up on a policy matter, I think you run policy. Um, how are you thinking about your policy priorities coming up, going into, or in the present session? Is that me or Alex? Uh, you, and then we'll jump to Alex and I'll <laughs> just want to follow up. directions, Mandy. Just want to follow directions. <laughs> Listen, from a policy standpoint, again, we've got to do a lot at the same time. Um, we just put out our 400 million dollar uh, internal uh, or investments in, in the African-American community. Um, I think from a policy standpoint, we've got work to do internally, 
but we're also going to continue to advocate and through our partners and through PepsiCo for better policies uh, externally. Um, we work very closely with obviously mayors and governors and uh, members of Congress. And, you know, I think, uh, like I, I mentioned before, uh, it's time for corporations to, you know, be more forward leaning in these issues. So I think uh, we're going to, I'm going to really focus on our $400 million investment, making sure that those dollars are allocated appropriately and that we're getting a uh, return on that investment to make sure that we're doing what we say we're going to do. I think that's crucially important to our customers and to society at large to say, sure, right now you're doing all the right things and saying all the right things. But in a year, we want to make sure that we are still there. And that's, that is my number one priority right now. Right. Uh, well, changing the debate on both equity and diversity and moving forward and putting our resources into a cleaner future uh, all work together. So that's great. Uh, Alex, building back better, what are the most important things we should be doing now? And we can be doing that from your vantage point. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, Kenny certainly spoke to some of these. Um, I, I do think corporations are uh, more comfortable and getting more comfortable in terms of using their voice and their influence. Um, and you have certainly seen our CEO um, out talking a lot about everything from COVID to, um, you know, the murder of George Floyd and racial inequality here in the U.S to um, really calling upon corporations to set carbon neutrality goals and using his sphere of influence in order to do that. So that's certainly one thing. Um, another thing is obviously uh, having a, a supportive policy environment um, will be really valuable in building back better. Um, we have been working across um, you know, a number of different um, groups to look at uh, even now where we see a lot of um, gridlock uh, in, uh, in uh, climate related policy, you know, are there areas of just agreement or opportunity with um, a little bit more support behind um, could kind of get over the finish line. And then, um, you know, really importantly for an organization like ours that works with big corporations, or I should say corporations of all sizes, um, we are spending a lot of time with our clients talking about uh, a lot of the things that Michael raised, right? Like how do we, how do those clients really integrate ESG? Um, we, uh, we again are not perfect. We've all talked about our lack of perfection, but um, we are, you know, a, a decade or more down our path to, to really in, uh, incorporate ESG into the way we operate across our institution. And um, we're spending a lot of time with our clients talking about that journey. And, um, and looking at how they uh, really incorporate uh, climate-related goals and how can we support them in a whole host of ways, just it, providing advice and counsel with obviously capital, which is our, our mainstay, um, you know, the kind of soup to nuts. Um, we do see uh, companies really coming to the table wanting to have discussions around ESG, wanting to understand how they can improve their internal uh, their internal goals. Um, there is a ton of evidence. Uh, and Michael sort of talked about this a little bit from his own perspective. There's a ton of evidence that um, you know companies that incorporate ESG, they're leading in an ESG space. You know, climate and um, social issues and everything that we've talked about on this call perform better. Um, they are less risky investments. They um, perform better over the long term. Um, and frankly, uh, indices and, and other funds that are, have an ESG focus have outperformed in this really challenging market environment. Certainly not all, but many. Um, so I, I think there's uh, a real advantage to investors that are looking at this. There's um, a real upside to companies that are really weaving this into how they operate. And um, I think in the ecosystem of all of us, whether you're an investor, whether you're a bank working with clients, whether you are a company um, you know, uh, like Pepsi who is working across industry sectors, to really think about how we promote um, this uh, adoption across environmental and social issues of ambition among um, corporations as well as individual investors and individuals in general. Um, I think that's how we, we make progress and we make progress faster. Great, We're, we've got a few questions or more than a few. So let me turn to the questions that are coming in from our listeners. 
Um, but first I'm gonna ask, if we all got off this phone and came together to have a say in a robust fashion with leading asset owners, leading asset managers, with banks and corporations, on how we spend the next two and a half trillion dollars where the United States is moving. Um, is there an appetite for bringing that kind of collaboration together and moving forward? Uh, Michael or jump in, any of you. Um, I think we have an appetite. You know, we found that when dealing with these challenges, collaboration is our greatest tool. You know, alongside of working with series, uh, other organizations out there I mentioned, like Climate Majority Project or a group like uh, SASB, provides a framework for evaluating material risk factors is really helpful to us. Um, we think that the other things we can do are integrating climate risk into our investment policies. If you haven't done that already, uh, if you haven't designated a particular team in your office responsible for the evaluation of climate risk, you know, you can't just put a, a green check mark next to it and say you've done something. It's an ongoing process and in, engage uh, engage with companies out there. It's what, well, um, these are the things we're trying to do. Uh, we think uh, more money in the system here. If it is spent well, it's invested wisely, reimagining how we rebuild our uh, economy, um, we will have a brighter future. And Michael, I will say your work um, in engaging with companies through Climate Action 100 and others where the shareholder process, and it's not all adversarial, it's engaging, um, has been remarkably successful. The number of companies that have changed their practices, committed to one or net zero goals uh, was greater than ever this year, and many of them coming out of those discussions. So thank you. Um, we're excited. Last week, we were really excited. Southern Company, it's not perfect, but they announced an updated climate strategy with a goal of achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Um, we need to hold their feet to the fire and make sure they follow through with this. But I think we've had to date seven companies engaged by our coalition that have made similar commitments. Yeah, great. And we're seeing higher votes and more of them. Uh, a few questions on the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor is looking at a change right now to roll back um, the ability to invest with an ESG lens, something that's been put to bed in the past. We thought it was dead for good, um, but it is not. And many questions coming up on that. For any of you who are watching that, I would love a quick opinion. Um, Kenny, it seems like it's not on your radar yet and it's just been happening. Uh, Michael, have you been looking at that yet? Uh, very closely. Uh, I, I wish I'd say I was surprised by this, but I think the current administration has made their priorities very clear. Um, you know, it's I, I find it odd that they talk about the primacy of shareholders, yet they try and take away our ability as shareholders to have some impact in the company out there. I mean, this is this is an area for me. Uh, I get attacked a lot for maybe supporters of the president saying that I'm pushing my values on these companies, and their role is just to uh, run the company. They don't want to fix their values. But I think that by pushing our values, pushing our values, ES, ESG issues, we're looking to minimize risk. We are creating long-term sustainable value in these companies. And it just happens to be an added benefit that in efforts to create long-term sustainable value, it aligns with my personal values. So yeah, the, the Department of Labor uh, ruling out there, we have signed onto several letters here. Uh, we think this is probably going to be fought. Uh, for a while, our hope is that there'll be action taken in, in November uh, that will make our fight a little easier. Uh, but it definitely odd and going against the tide. I was on a BlackRock um, webinar yesterday where some of the largest um, asset owners and asset managers were affirming what you've said. Unquestionably, firms that look at sustainability and integrate it are companies that are doing better in the market and not worse. Um, so beyond words, not, not logical. Um, yes. So we get, um, it is about resources. Moving forward, how do we get the right resources into the right energy systems, transportation systems, design systems, and what's blocking us? And what's blocking is often a, a tough political battle and constituencies and sectors. Um, how do we get a louder voice? on moving forward. And again, it's a similar question to building back better. Can we build broader, deeper 
coalitions with business, with investors, with banks, and frankly, with conservative groups. We've had many climate conservative groups on our webinars saying climate is an issue that is about life and religion and the economy. Um, but where, where do we go to assure quicker change, faster change, uh, and more effective change? As we know, timing is as much an issue as anything else. Uh, let's start anywhere. Jump in, Alex. Yeah, I mean, we definitely need to broaden the tent, right? Um, in terms of the, the audiences that we're talking to and try and do that in a way that makes these issues less polarizing. Um, I think we've all been talking uh, about the idea, and Michael talked about values when he was responding to the question on DOL, and, and certainly there are a lot of value-based investors that are focused on these areas, but I'll, I'll say there are a lot of just financial, right, and investment return-based investors that are focusing on these areas because they understand that um, this is a way to more effectively manage risk. This is a way to get better returns. The companies themselves understand that they do better, right? Their workforce is more productive. Um, they have better ideas flowing through their organizations if their workforce is diverse. They're, I think Kenny talked about this earlier, about the excitement of youth, but I'd say the excitement across um, whole groups of people around um, making you know more sustainable change within organizations. So I think we have to stop looking at this as an issue where you know industry is one side and is on one side of the fence and environmentalists are on the other side or social advocates or whomever it might be and really work within industry um, to talk to various different groups in a way that makes more sense to them. Maybe it's a financial driver, maybe it's about their employee base, maybe it's about reputational value, maybe it's about driving more investors to their companies, a, a, a diverse, a more diverse investor base, which we've seen with the advent of the green bond and social bonds, bringing other investors to corporations. Um, so I think we need to meet people where they are and what their priorities are and really speak to that and try and drive consensus um, among uh, you know this this bigger tent. So getting to 1.5 degrees, uh, uh, the shared goal or a net zero economy by 2050. What more, Kenny, can we be doing with corporate America? I mean, the number of people you reach, the size and clout of the company, really uh, extraordinary leadership will make a huge difference. Yeah, listen, I think. Uh, I think continue to push corporations in the private sector, it, it's, it's working. Um, you've seen corporations and private sector entities um, make goals and achieve those goals. And, and, you know, particularly, you know, when I started in 2013, you know, we've had, we've redone our goals a couple of times since then because, you know, we've met them. And uh, getting to Alex, Alex's point, you know, what a great opportunity to find and build different relationships and different partnerships with maybe some potential folks or organizations you may not have thought you could align on with anything. But, you know, as she mentioned, it doesn't take everything. It just takes a couple of things to line on and to move the ball forward. And I think that's where I think that's where the opportunity is um, on climate change, on social justice reform. I think there's an opportunity to really align common interests across a diverse spectrum of, of people. And um, I think that's where uh, corporations like PepsiCo and Bank of America can, can lead the way. Brands that people know and, uh, and, and that people have, are familiar with um, doing things together um, as an industry with uh, global and, and local partners. I think that's where the opportunity is. And, you know, again, you mentioned setting goals and that's where the push comes you know don't settle for what you can do but ask yourself what may maybe you can do beyond that and that's where that's where the momentum comes that's where corporations start to run and figure out how to say yes to things as just as opposed to well we've never done that before that's where you want to get to when people say okay i don't know how we're going to do it but we're going to figure it out and we're going to go in that direction and i think that's where we are well, we got to get there faster, and I couldn't agree more, but I'm going to ask Michael to have the final word on um, why of the shareholder resolutions or the dialogues and the analysis that's been going on, 
uh, we're certainly doing better, but where do we have to get to get to that net zero future? Michael, you're on mute, I think. Thanks, I had a reverb earlier and I put it on mute. Um, I think we all we get more people working in the same direction. And to that extent, last year in the state of Illinois, we passed a sustainable investing act. It requires all public fund managers in Illinois, including state and municipal pension funds and treasuries to integrate ESG factors into investment decision-making. It requires all to establish an investment policy that recognizes these factors. Now, does that mean that everyone uh, tomorrow is gonna have the same zeal we do in the treasurer's office that I do? No, but the, by making them stop and consider these risk factors, we think it's part of their fiduciary duty, we think we're gonna have more pension funds doing the same thing. And so I, quite frankly, have been proselytizing and having other states do this as well. Uh, I think when we get more people realizing the benefits of considering not just your traditional analysis, but other risk factors, uh, we're gonna have better performance and we're gonna help get to those climate goals. Great. So uh, if we could have some of the largest banks, largest pension funds, uh, and largest corporations out there setting goals, uh, we can get there. So let's keep pushing for the most audacious goals. I thank you for all that you've done, uh, but we've got a lot of work ahead of us. I look forward to working with you to get there. Uh, and now back to my colleague, Don Martin. Don, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Kenny, Michael, Alex, and, and also you, Mindy, for taking part of today's closing session for Series 2020. You know, when the COVID-19 outbreak began in the US, we made the decision quite quickly to transform our in-person convening in New York to a virtual series of digital programs. And while we've not had the same kind of in-person networking experience we were hoping for, the tremendous participation we've seen over the last several months has clearly demonstrated to us that committed advocates will find a way to move forward. I want to just note that we've transformed three full days of important content into 28 virtual sessions. We had 107 speakers from across the sustainability landscape and more than 5,550 participants from across the globe to tune into Series 2020 in our new remote reality. Needless to say, each of you have helped us exceed all of our expectations. Our goal for our digital transformation has been not to just bring people together, but to share important perspectives and inspire change and collective action. I hope in the coming days and months, it'll become evident what we have all done to achieve that goal. I'd like now to close by reiterating the urgency for action from investors, companies, policymakers, and civil society to address our most pressing global challenges, from uprooting social and structural racism to an inclusive recovery from the COVID-19 crisis to avoiding the most severe impacts of the climate crisis. So I wanna thank you all, along with our sponsors who have provided instrumental support for the entirety of Series 2020. Please be on the lookout for a follow-up email with more details about upcoming events for us in the coming year and with the link for this recording uh, for this session. Uh, stay tuned um, for Series 20, 2021, um, which will be held in March of 2021. And the details are being worked out and we'll get them to you as soon as possible. Thank you all for your support and commitment. Series 2020 is now adjourned and we look forward to being in touch with you. And we have one more additional slide that has just jumped up. Uh, we have another exciting event that will be coming up called An Evening with Series. You'll see Indra Nui from PepsiCo will participate along with Mindy Luber, uh, a number of other guests, Christiana Figueres, Norman Lear, Depender Suja from Capricorn Investments, Peter Coffin, Veronica Eady. It will be an evening that you won't want to miss. Uh, it will be more of a production than a webinar. It will be um, a, a fun time for one and all. So please join us July 28th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And now, Series 2020 is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.